Okay. Yes, Lord, we just welcome you. Lord, we thank you that each and every moment is filled with your goodness, with your joy, with your pleasure. Lord, we just come and acknowledge all of heaven right now, the seven spirits of God, the four faces, and just the fullness of who you are in its vastness. We thank you, Lord, that everything that's released tonight is engraved upon our hearts and it echoes throughout all of eternity. We thank you that we can just enter into you with pleasure and just gaze upon you in awe and amazement. Thank you, Lord, that we can reap your fruits and simply be transformed by just, just sitting in your presence. And we thank you for the simplicity of walking in a loving relationship with you. Amen. Amen. Gosh. Yeah, that was awesome. It's actually amazing how uh, the three of our um, papers really intertwine really well. It's amazing. I think you'll see now as well. Just, yeah, all three of ours really complement each other amazingly. Yeah. Okay. So let's start. It's been an amazing journey, like theses always are, but the big problem is to know when to end it. That was for me always a struggle. And it's quite funny, especially knowing my topic was the eternal nature of God and looking at what eternity is and then trying to get myself to stop and not just dwell into that. That was almost one of my biggest struggles I had. I'm not sure about Diana Nudia, but even preparing now to talk before and you have to like stop yourself because the more you read your thesis, the more you get more ideas and more revelations and just more things you'd want to share. And you can really go down that rabbit trail and just fall into it. And that's actually one of the things I kept seeing during this paper. So yeah, let's get into it. Um, first off, my thesis was mainly focused on the eternal aspect of his nature, how mankind is to relate to that aspect. Uh, and just seeing what the scriptures instruct us on how to steward moments of time into his framework of eternity. So in short, the, the aim of my thesis was to prove that man is included in his eternal nature and that we can partake of that nature while we are still on the earth. So yes, going into a topic like that definitely was interesting for me. And one of the biggest things that made me realize is how little we know in the vastness of eternity. I mean, it's interesting to see how many structures and thought patterns we have that are actually completely aligned through our lens of time. It's funny, most things, you know, as man, we always validate things and value things and measure things according to the time that needs to be put into it or how long has it stood and that kind of thing. We always use that as a measurement. And it's so interesting to see that if we are to partake in the eternal nature, how do we actually value things? How do we measure things? Because that is definitely not the way that God actually measures it. It's so like, I think one of you mentioned as well, you know, the frustration of example, seeing someone suddenly receive blessings, even though they didn't have a long profile of good works or anything, and they suddenly get this breakthrough and you've been struggling for how long through something. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, is it really that God is measuring things according to time or is there something we are completely missing? You know, if he's, if he's outside of this vastness of time and standing in a place of eternity, what does it look like? What is the value of things determined by? So that's one of the things that really got me to, you know, just bring a lot of questions up. And especially in the times we're finding ourselves in, there's so many people asking, you know, what does this look like in the bigger picture? Why did so many people miss all of these shutdowns and everything happening? And is this just the sense of what are we doing in this time of chaos management? And this really got me to a, that thing of everyone knows, you know, yes, God works in all things for good. And we know that he's got a big plan for everything, but it really got me thinking, you know, okay, God, how do we actually partner with that in a, in a, you know, a really easy way? What's the foundational way of actually partnering with your eternal plan for events or people or things that come into our time. And it really, to me, the first thing that we always need to look at with any question, of course, as Christ's example was just always look to God. It's actually that simplistic, even though we make it more complicated. And that to me really was the, um, the first thing I studied into is what is the eternal nature of God actually like? What does 
his eternal aspect specifically, what does that reveal to us? What does it show about ourselves? Or what does it show about how we are supposed to function in our daily lives? Because it's easy to, you know, just, just often study God's nature in the one way that he reveals himself as. That's one of the things we learn about the, his eternal nature is the fact that he, there is eternal amount of dimensions of who he is. And that's why we are, at the end of the day, created for eternity. Because we're going to be in this endless dance where we continually see new revelation upon new revelation and fall in love with each and every measure of God that we see through what we think is time. But all it really is is a vessel that God brings through to manifest his desires and his love through. So let's see what we got when I was actually studying into his eternal nature. The first thing um, that really caught my grasp is that saying of, you know, he's the God that was, who is, and that is to come. And that really got me thinking of, you know, if that is the, that is the fact, every aspect of God is always intertwined with the other. There's always a relationship between the two. And through everything that God is and God does, he's always revealing a dimension of himself. So it made me look at what does it actually look like between those three? Is there a relationship between those three aspects? What does it mean for us to actually walk in what was, what is, and what is to come? Because if you look at what it really is, it's the past, it's the present, and the future. And at the end of the day, if you look at those together, what was in the past really does have a great effect on what is to come because we've, we walk on, you know, that's a foundation for what is to come pretty much. But at the same time, what is to come is at the end of the day going to become, you know, it's going to go down this constant railway, but each one of them has a complete different effect on the other. And just really having that total mindset shift of not being focused on, you know, we can easily look forward to the future and continually work towards something we want, but not realize that where we are now or the things that have been done is actually something we can use to get that right now. Just to actually be aware that we cannot merely focus just on small intellectual moments, but actually to have the full grasp of viewing his eternal perspective and all of them together. That was one of the biggest things we see that God's continually uh, pulling us into. And I did some studies in the scripture. It's one of the biggest things that God's used so many different instances and metaphors for is just to simply get the idea of cross across that he's not looking for momentary, you know, relationships, but at the relationships, but that's that supposed to be a habitual relationship with us. And that's the greatest thing that God keeps saying that if we really believe nothing can get between us and God, then time is one of those things. We can't say that God is governed by time or, you know, measured by time cure because he's greater than it. He's above it. He created it. And at the same time, um, when we look at that, we have to bring that into if his nature is eternal, then so must the relationship we have together be eternal. That's why when I looked at, okay, so what does God actually measure things by? What is the currency of heaven that is used to say what value is, you know, is, is time valuable if it's not running out for God? Is it time, the essence itself, that's the value? Or is it what is placed within the moment of time that gives that a value? That is the thing that I came to just realize, just thinking of how are we actually using our time that we've been given? How are we stewarding it? Because time in itself is worthless if you're just, you know, sitting around drinking a coffee. Even those things are good. It has its ways. It has its time. Coffee is amazing. Uh, but at the end of the day, the measurement of heaven is not time to justify something. But the measurement is plainly and simply put the intention of the heart. It's what's filling that moment. What's filling the, the drive of what you're doing in that moment. It's not the works you're doing in the moment, but the desires and the intent behind those works that's filling the moment. Like the dear and them talked about as well. You know, toiling in strife and just trying to get through things in your own works. At the end of the day, that's not going to bring you nothing. That doesn't have value in itself at all. It's simply Christ working through it. And the greatest part about that, if you're trying to get to a place where your time is filled with his intent is the Bible says, you know, he gives you the desire to do the things that he wants you to do, to do his works. So he even gives us that. It's just so, so crazy. Just like he makes it so simplistic. Our only responsibility is, is to get in his presence because then he simply gives that as a free offering gift. And that's what one of the biggest things I realized is just how much God did with his eternal nature compared to what he's asking us to do. I mean, if he, the whole point for me that I noticed throughout, you know, the vessel of time that he's using to express himself. One of the greatest things he did through that is he bridged it. He bridged the eternal eternity with time. And that's one of the greatest things that he wants us to do. That's why it says, you know, the, 
the lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth, before time, outside of time, but also he came into time to do that for us. And that becomes the very same blood. It carries the same DNA, the same frequency, the same covenant. And for us, when we step into that blood of Christ, we step into the blood before the foundations of the earth, outside of time. And we covered by a measureless currency that carries us into him, that carries us into his nature, into his DNA. And that is the simplicity of it. Is he's giving us a free will gift. That's what it is. It's just our matter of getting into his presence and allowing him to, you know, just carry us into that. Instead of like we saw in just so many measures being carried by works or uh, I had someone now recently also post a message where they talked about, you know, being carried, carried by, um, what's the word, by doctrine. It's actually amazing, you know, with today as well, where we see the times we're in and you can so easily lose grasp of God's perspective to not get, uh, get carried away by, uh, you know, doctrines or prophecies, even if they're good. The only thing we're supposed to be carried away by is Christ, to be led by the Spirit, where our opinions and our things do not determine, are not determined by what we hear or new information we find, but rather just simply the impulse of the Holy Spirit. It's like the word says, the mature sons of God are those who are led by my Spirit. And that's one of the, the greatest things that I kept running into. Let's look here. I just want to. Yes. Okay. So here's one of the um, Proverbs 12, verse 19 to 21. This is a um, passion translation it says the truth, uh, truthful words will stand the test of time, but one day every lie will be seen for what it is. That just also just covers again, that thing of, so uh, time is not used to govern or measure God or his or works or anything like that. But the one thing it does govern in a sense, according to the word is truth. And that immediately gave me a contradiction. That, well, I thought it was a contradiction where, you know, okay, but at the same time, God is truth. So, so can time measure it? And then I just looked into it again. And if you really look at it, it's not time that gives truth its value. Because it says, after time, truth will still stand. So rather, it shows us that true, the truth is not, you know, determined by time, but rather the lack of effect that time has upon it. So that to me was a massive thing where God just blew me and he asked me, you know, if I have to count my words or my statements or my lifestyles, you know, what is it governed by? Is it really truth? And it made me think of, you know, worshiping God in spirit and truth and all of those senses where truth is used. I'm trying to put it in the test of time and see, is it really, does it really have a lack of effect of time on it? Because really so many of the things that we say or we do is completely controlled by the kind the carnal idea of deterioration after the fall of Adam that we've been put under. And when we walk in that, everything in our lives, everything we build, the structures start to come into that, uh, that same system pretty much. So it just really kind of, that was one thing that really blew me away when I really looked into it. And then, yes, one of the um, hardest things when looking at the subject is, I think, for mankind to do is how do you relate to an eternal nature if everything around us is showing us the completely contradiction to that? Um, and really, to me, one of the biggest things I found is that that's one of the greatest aspects of what the prophetic is. That's why God says out of so many things, we have to pursue the, you know, really go after the prophetic. Because if, what is the prophetic if we really look, uh, look at it? Yes, it's the basic communication with God, but at the same time, it's also God giving something from his perspective, which is outside of time into time for us now to grasp on. And that is something that is everlasting. It's a truth that is standing. So for us to really step into eternal nature, we need to fully pursue the prophetic. And when we go into that, then that pretty much just becomes a natural. And it really is, it's a hard thing to, to not simply just make the deliberate decisions of, you know, now I'm going to focus on just, you know, the big picture and the eternal picture. Because um, there's been a lot of studies done where pretty much your subconscious runs 95% of your daily decisions in your subconscious. And that's a really a hard, they say it's a very hard thing to rewire because the greatest way to do that is through visualization. So how do you visual things from outside of time or from heaven? Where do you get the visualization? You know, uh, where do you get those visuals? And that's another thing where the prophetic comes in. When you look at the, you know, the seer aspect of it, where God gives you visions expired by him, visuals from his side, from his perspective. And that's why it can only come through relationship with God. This whole thing just shows about it's God giving it to you. That's all it is. 
and just really uh, it was interesting to see that you know with the whole so pretty much visualization meditation is one of the greatest things we have to rewire not just our conscious minds but even the subconscious minds and really step into a place where even without thought our minds are continually just focused on God just you know hearing his words meditating upon him like David did day and night and I mean looking at the whole eternal thing David's an amazing example I mean he walked with the Holy Spirit uh, before the new covenant you know that's a great thing as well there's just so many examples in scripture of people who were not bound you know God's blessings are not bound by time that's one of the biggest lies ever the biggest excuses we can have we can say you know one day when I have my things together then it will happen all of this thing is awful now it's just a matter of actually receiving that free will gift stop trying to toil for it and just go into a loving relationship with God that's what it comes down to really and it was just amazing seeing it. Like I said, it just mostly the Caesar showed me the vastness of what he has done and just how little he's really asking us to do. Um, so, yes, that was on um, relating to a the prophetic is one of the aspects that was one of the greatest things. And then I found the greatest struggle we face on the subject is not, you know, getting into that place, you know, the, into the heavenlies where he's given us a position, but rather remaining there. Like I think Diane also talked about, you know, on the idea about falling asleep, not being spiritually asleep. And I think that's our actual battle we have. And the, what God showed me in most of this was one of the greatest things that's happened is because we're not going according to his yearning when we do, you know, the works he wants us to do or just go about our daily life. As soon as we stop going according to his yoke and his yearning, we lose our intent. You know, you lose the purpose behind it. If God doesn't tell you, tell you, you know, this is what I want to give you, you're not going to have that, pur that purpose, that drive behind what you're doing. And as soon as you lose that, you lose your joy. Then you lose your hope and then you just lose your total overall authority. And that's when we see a lot of things like, you know, depression and those things come in, unfortunately. And if you see that, you know, where it's a mind shift of no longer going to according to his yearning or having the purpose, then at the end of the day, you see that is also, it started with a mind shift where you take your focus off of God. So really a lot of this is a thing of really taking full possession, not just of your conscious mind, but even the subconscious mind and actually going after putting in the time, not because you have to, because you actually want to, you have that desire and just getting yourself in his praises and he starts to flow through you in that. And just simplistically by that, he gives you all the tools you need. And that to me was just, yeah, that's pretty much one of the biggest things I kept that kept reoccurring in this. And yeah, just a lot of things pop up just now seeing again, just how descriptive the Bible is, especially uh, the Hebrews were very focused on visuals, just how much that, you know, they, I think they really understood that whole aspect of meditation and visualizing the scriptures are so visual actually for us. And that's a tool we have. And when we, when we engage the scripture and this, you know, the spirit together in a mindset of eternity, it's like they said, it really is a thing of, okay, God, go show me what that looked like or show me what that is going to look like. Uh, there's just so many things that popped up in my, it's a massive topic, this whole eternity thing. Um, and, you know, just so many questions, like, for example, people saying that, you know, their whole purpose is waiting for the second coming of God, of the Lord. What if you've already, seen, you know, like John, who already saw that, you know, there's a lot of things. I'm not even going to go into that, but there's a lot of questions you can pull from that one you know, of experiencing through God, you know, the fullness of it and just how much we choose to limit not ourselves, but God through the time and the way we view it. And yes, so that's, I think I'll stop there before I go <laughs> too much. It's a, it's a hard spiral to go into, but there's, yeah, there's a lot on it. Would you pray for us? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Lord, we just, we just thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the, just the amazement of what you've done for us, for what you've invited us into. Lord, that every moment in five time is just filled with your sound, your vibration. Each moment of time is a gateway to step into a dimension of you, who you are, Lord. Lord, I ask that you can touch each and one of us with relation of how to steward the moments of time according to the will of your kingdom, your eternal kingdom, God. Lord, that you would come and touch our hearts, Lord, with your yearning. Lord, your yearning for the people around us. Your yearning for all the nations. 
the yearning for your truth and the yearning for all of creation, Lord. Lord, so we just step into that steadfast truth. We step into the structure of your name. We step into the rest. And we thank you that you fully surround us each and every second. Lord, I ask for a greater awareness of that right now for each and every person. Lord, I ask for a greater impulse from your Holy Spirit, Lord, where each and every of our body cells, Lord, our souls, our spirit in fullness will just become so overweight and undone by you. Where we're just so sensitive that everything we do is just according to your words. That all our attentions and desires are driven from you, not from outside sources. And we just thank you for this amazing eternal journey of love with you. We thank you for the brooks of bliss where you plant us, Lord. Lord, and we love your ways. We love your commands. And we just bless you. Amen.